Welcome everybody. I'm Rebecca and this is The Good Book Club, our lazy learner edition. It's Tuesday night, 7 p.m. Mountain Time on September 27th and we have a very exciting presentation for you guys tonight. Before we get started on that, we're going to go through a couple quick upcoming events just so that we're all in the know as far as what's going on with The Good Book Club in the next couple weeks. We have on Thursday night, I think we have a slide at some point, we have on Thursday night, for those of us that are in Utah, a um, walkabout of Shoshone campsites going to be out in Ogden. Um, there's more information on the Facebook page about this. It's Thursday, September 29th at 7, sorry, I'm sorry, that slide's wrong. It's actually been moved to 6 p.m. So I'll put more information about that on the Facebook page, but it has been moved, I think, because it's later now, getting darker sooner. That's been moved to 6 p.m. That, so that's for our Utah Book Club members. All right. Uh, the next thing coming up is going to be on Tuesday, October 11th, and that is going to be another Lazy Learner discussion. This is going to be with Matt and Trisha Harward, and they're calling it a post-Mormon adventure in alternative healing. This is going to be really interesting, and we'll have more information that, about that on our different social media sites too. And then the last reminder of the night, of course, is our upcoming regular book club meeting, which is at a new time in October. It's going to be on Sunday, October 23rd at 11 a.m. Mountain Time. And we are going to be talking about early Mormonism and the magic worldview, D. Michael Quinn's amazing book. And this is more of sort of a fun multimedia presentation. So if you've read the book, great. If you'd like to try to read the book, great. Um, please attend either way because we're going to present, be presenting a lot of really interesting and fun information close to Halloween. So it's going to be awesome. I hope to see you all there. And now that brings us to our presentation tonight. This is our lazy learner discussion. And um, this is where we learn something new or get new information because we are not lazy learners. <laughs> We're going to be hearing from the amazing Liz Phillips tonight. And I have a little bio that she sent me, which I think is great. Liz Phillips is a mother, a project manager, and a survivor of two cults. She was the general contractor of her own home. She loves the mountains, family, and friends. So we are just thrilled to have her here tonight. We met her a month or so ago at Sunstone. Um, she's the granddaughter of, of um, the AUB prophet, Rulon Allred, and we were just like to welcome her to book club and let her start telling her story. And I'd love it, Liz. Uh, welcome. <laughs> I'd love it, Liz, if you could just start out by giving us a little background on the AUB, because I think a lot of us don't really know a lot about that. Absolutely. Do you want me to right now? Yeah. And All I right. think that kind of fits in with even your first slide, because you're going to be talking about your grandpa. Awesome. Okay. I will. I'll give you a little bit of a background. Um, I'm assuming most of you have heard of the FLDS with Warren Jeffs and his dad, Rulin Jeffs. So I'm going to go with that basis of knowledge. So if you don't know that, I apologize. You're going to have to be doing some quick Google searches. Um, but that's really where the origin of my grandpa begins. So when the manifesto came out, um, as some of us know, the mainstream LDS church kind of kept it underground. John Taylor, one of the prophets, um, definitely had more than one wife, was kind of hiding his wives, going under, underground. And it all kind of started with a man called Lauren C. Woolley. And he had a eight-hour meeting that he claimed that Joseph Smith, Heavenly Father, and Jesus Christ came down and commanded him and certain brethren to keep polygamy alive until Christ comes again. And that um, one of the one of the things that was important for this was that some a, a baby be born in the covenant every year. And that was, um, something that he took to heart and he kind of um, invited other men to live polygamy. So when Wilford Woodruff came down with the, nope, we're serious, we're really done, we're not doing this anymore, he kind of went underground and had this little group of men. And Rulin, my dad right here, was actually trying to convince his dad 
to not live polygamy anymore. So he had done a bunch of research and after he had done, and by this time, my grandpa was married, had three kids living in California, going to chiropractor school. And he was trying to convince his father to stop living polygamy. After his research, he discovered that um, he also believed in polygamy. So he brought this to his wife and his wife said, no, thank you. And she went back to live with her parents and their three children. And so then my grandpa found some other wives. Um, at that time, <clears throat> the 1953 polygamous raids happened. I know that FLDS talk a lot about it. It happened to my grandpa too. So a lot of the men that were living polygamy ended up being in prison and um, they got thrown in prison and they, they were under the threat of their children being separated from the wives, um, the children being adopted into foster care or into foster families or being adopted permanently. Utah and Arizona kind of did like a joint effort because there was other polygamists living kind of down south. Um, right after that happened, one of the priesthood holders who was kind of after Lauren C. Willie had passed away, then it was Joseph Musser. He passed the priesthood keys, the everlasting covenant keys, the polygamist keys down to Joseph Musser. Joseph Musser was getting older. He had offered the priesthood to a man named John Y. Barlow, but in his last year, he changed his mind and he gave it to my grandpa. And that's kind of where this starts. So that's where in 1954, the FLDS and the AUB split off. So that's why a lot of times when people hear that I'm polygamist, they automatically assume it's FLDS, but it actually was separated back in 1954. Some of the different, the differing beliefs was, um, he does not, they don't, my grandpa did not believe in marrying underage girls, which was something that John Y. Barlow and the FLDS line clearly has followed for a long time. Um, another one was he was a chiropractor, an herbologist. He, and he also delivered a lot of the babies for these women. So he also did not follow the, a baby needs to be born within the covenant every year as specific women need to be having children every year. It's more like uh, the whole group, when, there should be at least one child born within the covenant. So it, a lot less pressure on the women to have all the babies. And um, so it's kind of how my grandpa got started. He became the prophet, the leader of the AUB. It wasn't called the AUB back then. Back then it was called the group. I grew up calling it the group. Um, I think FLDS people before it became FLDS called it the order. So it was kind of the reason why it's so loose is my grandpa and really the early founders of polygamy really believed that the mainstream LDS church was the mother and the um, everlasting covenant polygamy true priesthood keys was the father. So when Christ comes again, the two will be married again, again, and, um, and then as polygamists, because they were able to keep it alive this whole time, they will be teaching mainstream LDS church how to live polygamy, <clears throat> who will be married once again. So it was a kind of separation of like mainstream church to, um, to priesthood keys. So it's kind of the separation. Um, my grandpa grew up mainstream LDS and he really had a love for the church and he uh, really encouraged his members to go to public schools. There wasn't a strict dress code. Um, he had, he encouraged them to go to the temple and get the endowments out because he really saw it as like a parallel interchangeable, um, relationship between the mainstream church and the, um, AUB. So that's apostolic apostolic, sorry, apostolic United brethren is kind of the religion that I grew up in. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. These are the seven original grandmothers of mine. These are the seven original wives that my grandfather married. My grandmother, Athleen, is the tall one in the back, in the very middle. She's actually the shortest. All the rest of them are sitting for sure. Um, and because of his decision to, well, not his decision, he got the priesthood keys from um, Musser, one of his wives actually left 
him and went down with John White Barlow to the Hilldale area. So I actually have family from my grandpa's side that live down there um, because she took all of her children and went down there. Um, so I have a little story about my grandmother. So at this point, my grandma, my grandfather was 35 years old, newly single, on the prowl for now multiple women, not just one. So he married four women. The two in the middle sitting down are twins. That's my grandma Mabel and gra grandma Melba. And then um, there is one on the left, and I think it's the upper left one. If you guys have seen um, Sister Wives with Christine that had just left Cody Brown, if you don't, I apologize, but if you do, that is her grandmother. So um, anyway, so we are related through the all red line. Anyway, so um, that's, so the story with my grandmother was, she was 18 years old. My grandfather went into her parents' home to share the gospel, share the priesthood word, everlasting covenant. Her parents heard what he said, rejected it, kicked him out, told him not to come back. And somehow my grandma decided that she really liked him. And so they were in secret communication for a little bit. She told her parents that she was going out for milk. She was the oldest of all of her siblings and never came back. She ended up eloping with my grandpa. So that was a very contentious with um, my grandmother's siblings for a long time. And, and her dad was pretty upset for a long time. Um, go ahead to the next slide. Okay, so this is our little family. Um, that's my grandma, Athleen, and my grandpa, Rulin. And then my mother, Rhoda, is up on the right standing up. So my grandmother did have a pretty small family for... Um, for being a polygamist, but they were very much integrated into real world time. So 1950s dress, short sleeve shirts, dresses. I mean, they really just lived among mainstream LDS. I know my grandmother played the organ for the ward. So um, during this time, there was this constant threat that my grandpa was going to be imprisoned once again. So my grandmother would tell her children, if you hear that the police are coming, I want you to run into the cornfields as fast as you can. And if they catch you, I want you to tell them that you want to go to your aunt's house, which is my sister, because her family members were still mainstream LDS. And she thought that would be the safest place for her children if her children got taken away. So my mom would have nightmares about running into the cornfield in the black of night, trying to get away from the police. Um, she, they grew up with this huge fear of making sure they didn't tell anyone that they were polygamous because it was this overwhelming threat that they were going to lose their mom and dad if people knew that they lived polygamy. And it really was a constant threat. In the 1953 raids, that actually did happen. Her dad did go to prison, uh, but... After that, it was kind of a looming threat. They did have some friends on the police force that gave them some heads up. So it actually never happened again, but it did, it was a threat at times. So at one point they escaped, I think in the middle of the night, he gathered all of his wives. They all kind of lived in the same area, gathered all of his wives and they took all of their kids and they drove down to Mexico and they had met the LeBarons um in prison and knew that Mexico was a safe place for polygamists he took all of his kids and his wives and they lived down on the LeBaron compound in Mexico for about a year um and then came back up um started and and really my grandpa was very charismatic very caring very loving very scriptorial um oftentimes very much described and similar to Joseph Smith or Brigham Young, where he really could, if you met him, you instantly fell in love with him. He saturated my whole life. Um, and I never actually got to meet him. That's how amazing he was. His wives, all seven of them revered him, thought he was the pure example of how to be a polygamous man. His children to this day, I've never met a child who would say anything cruel about him. Any of my aunts or uncles. Um, my aunt Dorothy actually wrote a book 
called uh, Praise, Predator, and Other Kinfolk, Dorothy Solomon. Um, that is kind of her child and how she grew up with my grandpa. So um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Melinda. So in 1977, Ervil LeBaron's two wives walked into his office, his chiropractic office in Murray, dressed up as men with wigs and pants and shot my grandpa and murdered him. So the whole point of Ervil ordering that, well, there was, there was a couple goals. Um, he, one of them was he wanted to have the tithing funds that my grandpa was receiving from the AUB followers and he wanted his followers. And then the other one was actually to draw his brother out of hiding because he was planning on murdering him too. Ervil had actually already ordered uh, the murder of one of his brothers and he was looking to get his other brother who was now in hiding. And if you want any really great information about kind of how Ervil started, what happened, how we got here to my grandpa's murder in 1977, a podcast called Deliver Us from Ervil is amazing. It um, So this point in, in 1977, I was born in 1979 and it I know I have stories of my grandpa so much, so I've never met him, but he was just such a huge figure in our family's lives in the AEB. And now truly he has been compared to Joseph Smith as a martyr because now he has been murdered for his beliefs. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, so this is my dad and mom and my other four moms. So my mom is in the pink cardigan in um, the middle or well, on the ground sitting. And then my mom's full sister, Colleen, is on the very left in the dark suit with a striped blue shirt. She also married my dad. So my dad has two wives from Rulin Allred from my grandpa. And then I've got my aunt Donna on the right, my aunt Carolyn on the left, and the one sitting on the floor is my aunt Rachel. And just to give you a little background about them, none of us live together in the same house. My dad always said, a happy wife is a wife that has her own home. So we did not grow up in the same homes. Um, I lived in West Jordan. Aunt Donna lived in Harriman. Aunt Rachel lived in Drake. Um, Carolyn lived in Sandy. Aunt Colleen lived in Murray. So we all they all lived in different places, but we did meet together for Christmases, Easter, Thanksgiving, my dad's birthday. And then we actually had a Thompson Sunday school that we would get together every morning on Sunday. So, um, they very much felt like my cousins. I would sleep over at my other mom's houses and I loved it because my dad was there. So it was like a little piece of home. And I loved it because I would call my aunts, my mom that night, because it would be so cool that I still have a mom. And sometimes I would even tell my mom, you know, mom, you're my favorite mom and I have five. So it's really a compliment, which now I look back, it's probably not the nicest thing to say to my mother, but I was a little kid, so I didn't know. Okay. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay. So these are just a little childhood montage. So this one on the very left is actually my mom right after she had me. So I was born in 1979 on Christmas day. My mom knew that she was going to have me. She gathered all eight of my siblings, packed up all the Christmas presents. She said she mopped the kitchen floor. I don't know. I wasn't out yet and went to my aunt Donna's house in Harriman and had me there in Harriman. So when I have to tell people where I'm born, it's not in a hospital. Um, and the next morning, I think she had me at like four in the morning. So the next morning, that's actually my sister, Heather kneeling over me and my mom. And that's her saying that I'm the best Christmas present she's ever had. So it was really sweet. Lots of good memories. Um, the next picture over the second one to the left is me sitting on my dad's back and my mom rubbing and cracking his back. It was one of his favorite things. It's what I remember. So my dad would come over every fifth night because he was on a schedule with five wives and we would have dinner and then we would often comb his hair. He had just really thick, thick hair and we'd stick elastics in it and braid it. And he was just really great that way. We had, I specifically had a very good childhood, good memories with him. 
I know that my other siblings have had a different story, especially the boys in our family. He was not kind or patient with the boys. So that was hard, but my personality and who I was, I had a great childhood. My mom, the middle picture on the right is her playing the piano. She was a beautiful pianist. I'm sure she got it from my grandmother. And we often were asked to sing as my mom played the piano and it was just so fun. Um, and this is my dad sitting on our stairs. I'm sure he did not read books to me. I don't remember that, but we all know as a mom, you have all the pictures of your kids with your dad because who's taking pictures, obviously the mom. So um, I did really like my mom, my dad growing up, but he, we had moments where he was very scary. Um, he was not very invested in our childhood. He had too many children. If I could just guess how, how his life was, as far as I understood, he came from a very abusive childhood. It was polygamist. He grew up in kind of the same way with polygamous parents. Um, so him marrying my mom and other women was not outside of his realm. It was very much what he was used to. So next slide. All right. This is my AUB baptism. And when I was active LDS, I would tell people it was my fake baptism. So this is when I was eight years old. This is my dad baptizing me in the font at the AUB building. So we called that building, the RCA, the rule and Clark all red building after my grandfather, obviously. Um, they do have a baptismal font there at the AUB. And then a separate building is actually, um, the endowment building. So originally polygamists did not have the endowment, did not have garments it was encouraged to go to the temple, go to the mainstream church, do whatever you got to do to get in good, get your temple recommend, go to the temple, get your garments, take your covenants out, go back to living polygamy. So my parents actually did that. Um, I know they went through the temple and then I do know they got excommunicated. My uh, parents did not go to like the disciplinary council or anything. They just let it be dis um, excommunicated. It's very common in, it was very common in especially my grandpa's branch to do that. He encouraged it. He loved the mainstream church and definitely encouraged that. So, but we did have our own baptisms. That on the right is my grandmother, Athleen. Um, and she was, she was just great. So go ahead and go to the next slide, Melinda. Okay. This is Easter. And so as you guys can see, we're all in just short sleeve shirts and pants, and we're all running around. This is obviously some of my siblings, not all of them, um, a mixture of my mom's kids and my aunt Donna's kids. My aunt Colleen, my mom's full sister never had any children. So, um, this all came from four women. Um, so I'm the one with the noodly ramen hair on the left with my tongue sticking out. I, I don't know why. So I think my mom gave me a home perm. So, all right, go ahead and do the next slide. So this is just a typical childhood. We would go on adventures. Um, my mom loved the outdoors. We went to the mountains, to the Capitol building and explored. We had parties. Um, and the picture on the right, I think is very telling of my childhood. And this is why. So it was very fun. We loved it. But up on the corner, in the right-hand corner of that specific photo is actually a photo of my grandpa. And he was everywhere. So my mom talked about him when we would go on hikes and she would say things like, I don't know the names of all these plants, but your, your grandpa sure did. And I would hear stories about him in church and I would hear stories about him from my aunt and I would hear stories about him from my dad. So he very much had a huge presence in my life growing up and really gave, it was definitely intentional, really gave a feeling of elitism, of that we are special, that God saved us for this time to come down and bring the truthfulness of the gospel to the mainstream LDS. We are Mormon, but better than Mormon because we have like all the keys of the priesthood. 
and we're very blessed and we should consider ourselves very lucky, very blessed. We must have been very righteous in heaven to, and I just thought I must be because I had such a wonderful grandpa and I have such a wonderful family. Um, during this time, I did go to public school and I grew up with the same stories that my mother did where she, what she told us, if you tell anyone that we are polygamist, you will lose your mom and dad. Dad will go to prison. Mom could go to prison. You will be thrown into the foster care system and could be adopted into another family. And my, and she said, my mother told me that if they ever came to run into the cornfields and wait until I see her again. So I actually had this huge fear of telling anyone that we were polygamist. It was definitely a big secret. And I had nightmares myself of running through the cornfield at night with like the corn hitting me in the face. Um, it was, it was really a hard thing. And it was confirmed by the way the mainstream LDS children treat, treated us growing up. Uh, we, we didn't tell anyone outside of our neighborhood, but in our neighborhood, they obviously knew. Um, and so there would be times where we would be walking home from school and the mainstream LDS kids at the local ward would throw rocks at us and we would have to run home as fast as we could. We were not friends with people at school that knew who we were. They were not allowed to be. And at one point I was probably, I know I was in elementary school. I want to say probably fifth grade and this new family moved in and we were so excited. They had five daughters and two of them were mine and my older sister's age. And we were like, yes, like this is, this is it. We're going to, we're going to finally have neighborhood friends that we can go play with in the neighborhood. And we played with them for a few months. And I went over one day cause I hadn't heard from them in a while and I asked if Feline could play and her mom stepped out and said, um, she's not allowed to play with you anymore. You guys are polygamist. We are definitely not allowing that to happen anymore. Please don't come back. And I was very upset and very sad that something that I had no choice in or no control over was something that made it so I could no longer have a friendship. And the, that family's uh, father's name was actually named Joseph Smith. So Joseph Smith's children were not allowed to play with the polygamist kids on the street. Um, so it just reconfirmed to us the importance of keeping our mouths shut about um, where we came from and who we are. And that not only do we have the fear of losing our parents, but we also are not allowed to have any friends. It made it very difficult as a child because when you grow up polygamist, you are growing up with the Book of Mormon, Pearl of Great Price, Doctrine and Covenants, very, very old school Mormonism. But then you are rejected by these peers who also have the same beliefs as you. We weren't drinking. We weren't partying. We, I could have the same Mormon lingo as the next mainstream LDS kit. And it didn't matter if they found out where we came from. They were, we were very much shunned. So by the time I got to junior high and high school, was really good at looking Mormon, um, acting Mormon, and really switching out my friend group to friends that didn't know where I came from, definitely didn't get friends from my neighborhood. Um, and so that's really what my childhood was. We were definitely like, if people looked at us, we weren't like the FLDS where they could say, oh my gosh, like they're a polygamist. Nobody had any idea, which was nice. At the same time, we were quietly carrying around a very huge secret and a very big worry that that definitely um, I had nightmares and had a hard time with as a child. So I really um, tried in junior high and high school to curate my life so that people wouldn't ask questions, think I was mainstream LDS, so that I would be allowed to have mainstream LDS friends, because realistically, they were the ones I related to the most. So I really wanted to be friends with them. I just made sure I found friends that didn't know me before in elementary school or lived near me. So go ahead and to go to the next slide, Melinda. So this is just kind of a demonstration of, um, if 
family vacations. We just, another point to be made is we definitely just looked normal, average 1980s. That's my mom and dad. And we're at a sand dune. That's my brother, Lewis. And we're just having a fun time. We really had a great childhood. Um, go ahead with the next picture. Okay. Um, so my mom was my dad's first wife. They were very much in love he would come over and they would sing love songs to each other. It was so fun to watch the way my mom and dad loved each other. And I was quite unaware that, um, I was quite unaware that he did not treat the other wives that way. They did not love each other like that. That was not the home they grew up in. Speaking to my half siblings was interesting because I have this memory of my mom and dad just being so romantic and loving each other. And it just wasn't like that for the other wives. I thought that was interesting. And I did see a question finally, if my um, five wives, the five wives ever went on vacation together and the answer is no. My mom never talked bad about the other wives, but now that I'm an adult, I don't think they liked each other very much, but I never heard my mom talk bad about the other wives. And I don't know how it was in the other wives' homes. So but no, they never went, we never went on vacation together. Um, all right, next slide. All right, this is my immediate siblings. This, my mom and dad, obviously in the middle. And this person on the left is me. And you would think you've got to be 12 in that picture, but I'm not. I think I'm a junior or senior in high school because that's how pretty I was. I had braces. Um, so this is the, my, there's 10 of us, 10 um, kids. And I'll just go down the line really quick. There's a lot. I apologize. Um, the one with the brown hair at the top standing up is my oldest brother, Andy. He did marry into the AUB, but has since left. He's atheist. My blonde brother, Eric, is part of the AUB still. He only has one wife right now, but he definitely believes in it. I think, I think he's probably just going to keep one wife. He says one wife's enough for him. So that's great. And then my sister, Janice and Mary Jane are the two brown hairs on the right-hand side. One is sitting next to my dad and the other one has a jean shirt on. Those two sisters were married to the same man. Um, it didn't go well. That man had five wives. He decided he didn't believe it in polygamy anymore. My sister with the jean shirt stayed with him. They are now completely out. And the one sister that's sitting next to my dad is still in the AUB, but single. Don't ask me why. I don't ask her. Um, okay. The redhead with the pink shirt on the left-hand side standing up. She lives in Pinesdale, Montana. That is actually another uh, community of the AUB. There's communities in Pinesdale, Montana. That's about an hour out of Hamilton. There's places in Wyoming, Mexico, Santa Quin, Cedar City. I think there's one in Canada. Um, I think that's everything. I, I'm sure I'm missing some. Um, anyway, so, but she doesn't believe in polygamy anymore, but her home is in Pinesdale and she stays there, but she's completely out too. Then it's my sister, Rhoda Lynn, on the very left-hand side. She is active, AUB. She has a sister wife and she lives in Santa Quin. She is a lovely human being who is so kind and lovely. She's actually the sister I'm closest to. She's a beautiful soul and she has 12 kids. So, so many makes me tired. Um, all right. And then next is my brother, Lewis, and he is right next to the blonde one. Yep. He passed away when he was 29. Um, so he was never married. Um, and then I've got, so he joined the mainstream LDS church. My sister, Lene, who's sitting next to me with the short reddish hair, she joined the mainstream LDS church. I joined the mainstream LDS church later. And then my baby sister, Katie, who's got the little lizard necklace, she did too. So that's kind of a rundown really quick of my siblings. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, so we're gonna, I'm gonna take you back for a minute, back to my teenage years. Just a reminder, I was really good at being um, Mormon looking, mainstream Mormon looking. I was in choir. I had a huge group of friends. It was awesome. I loved my high school um, experience. And my sister that was just older than me that I just shared actually decided to join the mainstream LDS church. 
and she was only two years older than me. So I'm a sophomore, she's a senior. And all of a sudden, everyone in the school is going to find out she's getting baptized. So that was a little like, uh oh, my kids, my friends are friends with her friends, and it's probably going to get around. Um, but I was a very, oh, and we did go to me, we did go to seminary. I was encouraged to go to seminary because again, my grandpa had this love for mainstream LDS. We were learning the same things. So no, I didn't get any questions from the seminary teachers. I think someone asked me that at one point and no one said anything to me. Um, I don't know how they kept track of it back then, but I did go to seminary all four years. I'm a sophomore. I'm sitting in the AUB church. At this point, my grandpa obviously has passed away and his brother, Owen Allred, is now the prophet, the leader of the AUB. And I'm sitting there like a good polygamous child. And I am got my little notebook out and I'm writing all these notes and I'm writing everything he said, cause I'm going to study it later. Cause I'm just, I'm all in. Um, and I'm just going to just be so great. And I'm sitting there taking my meeting notes. And, um, he says, uncle Owen says, um, what makes our break off of the Mormon church, the correct break off. Um, and at that point I was like, wait, what? So you're calling the church that I belong to the break off. So that really was a thought stop for me. And I took it home and I really sat on it. And my sister found the note that I had written. I think it was in my journal. So great. Thanks. And she bore her testimony to me of the mainstream LDS church. And I often described it as it was like a light had been flipped off or flipped on in a room. And I could finally see the room. And I decided right then to join the mainstream LDS church. So I was 16 and now I had a huge problem because I'd been lying to my friends about being mainstream LDS. So now what am I going to do? I, I'm going to get baptized when I'm 18. I don't know how to have that conversation. So I kind of pulled my best friends aside and talked to them quietly and specifically about growing up polygamist. They were beautiful and wonderful. I'm sure something to do with me wanting to join the mainstream LDS church had a lot to do with it. So they didn't really feel like they needed to save my soul because I had done it all on my own and decided to be baptized. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. I'm sorry, Melinda. Okay. So as a polygamous child, you do not get to get baptized until you're 18. It is the November 15th policy that has actually been in place for polygamists since I'm pretty sure 1935. So it's pretty painful to join mainstream LDS church when you're growing up polygamist. I absolutely had to wait until I was 18. There was no questions asked. Even my mom even gave me permission to be baptized. Doesn't matter. You have to wait. I had a meeting with my bishop and he went through the temple recommend questions. He asked all these things and he, um, told me my parents were living in sin because they were um, living polygamy and they were probably going to have to go to hell. And um, I met with the stake president, the area president, and I finally had to meet with Elder Worthland. So that is a requirement when you are mainstream LDS, or I mean, sorry, AUB or polygamist, anything, any polygamist background you're coming from, you have to meet with a member of the 12 apostles. And mine was Elder Worthland. And he was very kind, very lovely. I did ask him how I could definitely forever and always stay in the mainstream LDS church. Cause I was in, I was all in. And he told me to read my scriptures and say my prayers and go to church. So it was very anticlimactic. Um, okay. Go ahead and go to the next photo. Um, okay. So I get, so my sister is just older than me. She got baptized. I get baptized at 18. My brother, Lewis gets baptized. Same thing. He ended up meeting with elder Holland. My mom decided when I, after I was married, you can see my two little kids kind of at the top is my mom's baptism. You can kind of see my two little girls there. I'd been married and had two little girls. Um, she had a difficult time. So as a married polygamist woman, she divorced my dad and then met with, met with her bishop. And then she asked me to come with her to meet the state president. So I walked in, guess who the president was? Joseph Smith. So Joseph Smith is sitting there and he's asking my mom all these questions and I'm there and he's saying, 
He's asking her the temple recommend questions. He's saying, I want you to understand that you lived in sin for the past 40 years, living with your husband. And I want you to repent of that. So you're going to have to go to a disciplinary council. And then kind of when we were getting up to leave, he said, I hope you had a really good time in our neighborhood. Cause again, he lived down the street from us. And she said, you know, I've always had an okay time, a great time living in this neighborhood, but I know that my children have had a hard time. And he, he goes like, Oh, that's, that's weird. Okay. And so I turned to him and I said, it, it was your children. You didn't let your kids play with us. And he goes, Oh yeah. Yeah. That checks out. That's right. Um, yeah, we're, I teach my kids that polygamy is absolutely wrong and it's sin and it's horrible. So yeah, that's exactly what I did. So he had no shame and he didn't care and he felt great about it. So, um, I went to the disciplinary council with my mom and we went into that conference area with all the big table and the chairs and men I didn't know, but of course, Joseph Smith was there too. And she basically had to admit that she had been living in sin um, for the past 40 years and denounce polygamy in front of everyone and promise she'll never do it again. And it was very demoralizing. I, I had a very hard time with it as an active member of the church. Um, now looking back on it, it makes me really sad that she had to go through such, and she was willing to. She was willing to take whatever the Mormon church, whatever shame they wanted to give her, whatever repentance process she had to go through. She was willing to do that. I did get a question of why my mom divorced my dad. He wasn't a great husband. Um, he was kind of um, sexist and would pull his uh, patriarchal, I'm the priesthood holder, you will listen to me, um, things all the time. And, and I think she just kind of fell out of love with him and disenchanted with polygamy. So it, I, it was a long time coming. I think my mom and dad, um, weren't happy for a long time. I didn't know, obviously by now I was out of the home. And so it, I, you know, she complained a lot about him and ended up divorcing him. And, uh, at this time, actually, um, my aunt Colleen, the one that had no children and was a full sister to my mom had actually already divorced my dad and joined the mainstream LDS church. So by now my dad has lost two wives and four children, three children to the mainstream LDS church. And he really had a hard time with it. He was not okay with it. So, um, all right, next slide. Okay. So my senior year, I just think this photo is funny. My senior year, I won a trip to Disneyland. My mom and dad came with us and that's my dad. He was charismatic. He was a goofball Two people that didn't know him very well. He, um, he really could just make you think he was the funniest person. He was scriptorial. He very much paralleled my grandpa, Joseph Smith. Um, so I'm just, this is just the funny, goofy side of my dad. He was definitely okay being funny. Um, he was really good at putting that on for other people that weren't just like his wives or his children. All right, next slide. So I got married in 2000 and he, it was just dream, dream come true. I knew when I got baptized into the mainstream LDS church, all my dreams would come true. I was no longer ostracized by um, the community, by my peers. I didn't have to live in shame. I didn't have to live in secrecy. I just was so excited. Got to be married in the Salt Lake Temple. My dad thought that was really cool. Um, I was living the dream. I was so happy. I knew when I chose to get baptized at 18 that I was changing the trajectory of my life. And I was so excited to be able to do that. It was everything I wanted to be. It was, I didn't have to, um, worry, um, about being ostracized or losing friends over the choice that my parents had made. And I was just so excited and so happy. Um, all right, go ahead to the next slide. 
Um, this is my cute little family when they were young. This is kind of like the demonstration of like, so I was able to be a stay at home mom. So I very much fit the example, the template, the, uh, what every Mormon person is taught should be, I was able to be a stay at home mom to my fun kids. We had a very, um, close neighborhood. We were all Mormons. So I had, I was all the callings you could ever be. I was in the state primary presidency, the young women's presidency. Um, at 29, I was the relief society president, like just a hundred percent in so excited to be there. So happy to be part of this community that I had been looking at from a distance for so long. Um, I was very, very, very happy. I loved being a mom, which I know a lot of people don't feel that way. Um, so I just considered myself really lucky. I loved my, I love my husband. It was just very easy. I fell into that role very easy. There was no reason for me to question. There was one thing that I did that was a really big deal was I made sure that my children were kind to everyone. The way I grew up scarred me. And I wanted to make sure my children never treated someone of a different faith or a different belief different. So my kids would come home and say something like, um, you know, blah, blah, blah is an LDS. And I'd say, and I'd always say, does that matter? It doesn't matter. It matters about their, um, their morals and, and being kind to people. So even as an active F or an active LD mainstream LDS, I definitely instilled in my children that it didn't matter if people were Mormon or not, because I'd been so influenced by my childhood. Um, go ahead and go to the next one. So this is just on the very left-hand side, me at women's conference. I sing in the tabernacle. These are my best friends from high school. We were all Mormon. I think this was her son's farewell. I just, this is me embracing my life and knowing that it is just exactly what I want it to be. I once told my husband, if I could control anything about him, it would be that he would never lose his testimony and stay in the church. So that bit me in the butt later. Um, go ahead and go to the next one. Um, my, we had four children. I thought our family was complete and we actually adopted our last one. He is a family baby and we were able to get sealed to him in the temple. It's awesome. Loved it. Then he was my child from time and all eternity. I was so excited. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, okay. So this is kind of a pivot from 2000. So I think we adopted my son in 2011 and in 2014, my dad became the prophet and the leader of the AUB. And, um, I didn't really care because I was like, well, it's not my pig, not my farm. Like, I don't know. It's it's not part of my religion. I mean, he was a horrible dad. I can't imagine him like trying to wrap around that he might be a prophet, um, or a leader of my church. So I'm out, you know, I'm good. And, um, one of my sisters did come to me and she was having a really hard time with my dad being the leader. And I couldn't understand why she finally shared with us that, um, she had a memory, uh, when she was very young, about eight years old of a temple ritual that had to do with molestation of children and there was a group of men, adult men, and there was a whole bunch of little girls in white dresses, and she was one of them. Um, obviously, there is more details to the story, but I don't feel privy to share them because I wasn't there. It wasn't my experience, but I will never, I will never take that away from my sister and claim that I know better and that um, it didn't happen. And that was really, really, really hard for me. And that was the little string that pulled on the sweater that unraveled the whole thing. Um, it made it so because of her molestation happening with temple signs, temple rituals, it made it so I didn't want to go to the temple anymore. And it was very traumatizing to me. So temple ward night would come up and I'd be like, I, I can't do it. And I ended up being so upset and sad. And I ended up, I told my husband about it. Like, I just, I can't go to the temple. It reminds me of my sister. And then the whole thing happens. I can't imagine what she must've felt like as a child. And I did what all good faithful LDS members do when they're going through a faith crisis, they go to their stake president, right? He's the spiritual leader. So I go to the stake president 
and I tell him I'm really struggling. I'm crying, losing it. I'm like, I don't want to lose my testimony, but I really can't go to the temple anymore. What do I do? And I'm crying. And I say, you know, this horrible thing happened to my sister. And this reminds me of that. And it was, and my dad was part of it. And that was hard because I'm trying to wrap around this fun, loving dad that I had with what her experience was. My whole world was falling apart and I had brought my husband with me and he turned and looked at my husband and goes, so what do you think we should do? Didn't even talk to me. And my husband just looked at him like, we're here for like, that's why we're here. I don't know what to do. She's very upset. And, um, he just said for me to go and look at the temple and just go look at it and just stare at it. And then maybe I'll feel the spirit and want to go in it. And I, at that moment thought, wow, he doesn't get it. Okay. Okay. He is not a safe place for me. And I have to figure out this on my own. And that really started my deep dive into Mormon history, um, where I stand on LGBTQI issues, um, racism. And it, it really, it just was the little pull that just took me down the spiral of, I think I, I think I've been bamboozled. I think I've been lied to. And I, my husband says, looking back on that, that I cried almost every day because I had fought so hard to get where I was and to find out I'd been lied to not only just when I joined the mainstream LDS church, but growing up, we had been taught and to revere all of these men and to find out for me in my experience, they seemed like power hungry men who abused their power it was very upsetting. And I thought, wow, I could lose my spouse over this. If he decides to stay in the church, what if my kids don't love me anymore or listen to me anymore because they find out I'm out and I no longer have the spirit. Um, what if I lose my friends? that I have gained over these years. Um, how honest do I want to be? And worse fall, what if I become a bitter ex-Mormon and, and I start saying horrible things about the church. So for years, I decided to be very quiet about it. I didn't say anything. I went to church. I'd sit in sacrament with my children, go home and cry my eyes out during relief society and Sunday school and go back and pick my kids up. And finally, my husband said to me, I know what you're doing. Like, I know you're not staying at church. And I finally had to tell him that I, it's because I couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't handle it. At the same time, my girls started going in young women's and they had just changed the policy to not only 12, but now 11 year old men, girls and boys can be in young men and young women. And at this point, Sam Young had come out with listen to the children, the uh, mission president who was having sexual relations with missionaries had come out. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm not leaving my girls alone with the bishop ever. And so I took my, um, took my daughter, my 11 year old, she just turned 11. She's going to be in young women's with me to go see the bishop. And he said, he was just this great guy. And he starts going through the temple, recommend questions. She's 11 playing with Legos. Like that's, she had one friend and they were like, she had an imaginary friend and she had one real friend and she couldn't even say her name, right. She could barely get her B's and C's. So he goes through the thing and then he gets to the point and he says, um, have you been looking at pornography? He asks the pornography question. And my daughter looks at me and then she looks at him. She goes, I don't, I don't know what you're saying. And I turned to her and I said, we're going to have this conversation later. We can talk about it. And then I turned to him and I said, this is a very inappropriate question for an 11 year old. And I'm not comfortable with it. And he apologized profusely. He felt awful. He just said, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize what I was asking. Um, I would like to apologize. You're right. And we went on our merry way. And I actually got a text from him um, apologizing that night. And it was a pretty long text. And he just said, I, I know that was inappropriate. And I apologize for what I said. Um, and I really respected him. And it, it made me think how many good people are out there doing the best they can with the information they have, having no idea the damage that they are creating in other people's lives. Um, anyway, so it was, um, it was difficult at this time. 
I was having a hard time with my girls, young women, they were young women leaders. They were telling them things like, it's not really your body, your body's rented. They were only baking bread and making dinners while the boys got to go on high adventure camps. And my daughters are mountain bikers and hikers and dirt bikers. And they really were not fitting the mold of bread making and dinner making and making a husband happy and writing down what you want in your future husband. So they would go to church and then come home and I would deconstruct that with them. Like, oh, does that make sense? Does is that feel right to you? What do you think? It was getting really hard um, at this time. So I was quiet about it. Didn't tell anyone else. Only, only my husband knew. I actually joined the Fern Foundation on the bottom left-hand side. I'm standing next to Lindsay Hansen Park. I don't know if any of you know her. She is, she does the Year of Polygamy podcast. She does Sunstone. She's amazing. And um, at this time, she knew of what I was going through. She invited me down to the Fern Foundation. We went down to Hilldale and helped rebuild the community down there. We actually worked in the park there. Um, the upper right hand side is Roy Jessup. He or Jeffs, excuse me. He is um, he was the son of Warren Jeffs. And him and I really connected over being prophets kids. And um, he ended up um, unaliving himself a, 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 probably two years ago. Anyway, he, his dad and the childhood he went through was very traumatic and very hard for him. And um, I miss him so much. And we really connected on a lot of levels. And it was really nice to have someone go through kind of um, being the prophet's daughter and the prophet's son and what that looks like as children. Um, but I had an FLDS girl braid my hair. What a full circle for me. I felt just hearing stories about my grandpa's other wife's children leaving and going to the FLDS and not having any contact with them. Uh, we, we cleaned out a chicken coop and it was a volunteer effort. So go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, I also took my children to meet the Muslim night. I was all done pretending that uh, we were better than anyone else and decided to expose my children to as much culture as possible. So up on the left-hand corner, this was at meet the Muslim night. They let you try and had jobs. It's just so fun. They're so kind. The food was amazing. They answered all of our questions. My children realized how much Mormonism and Muslim Islam is very similar in a lot of ways. It's a high demand religion. They don't drink alcohol. Um, they have their Book of Mormon, their Quran. Um, anyway, it, it was a beautiful night. And then um, on the right hand side is actually my friend Nimra. So her and her husband are from Pakistan. And I've been friends with her husband for probably 10 years. Her, uh, my husband and her husband worked together and then she got married. I think she is their first cousin because in Pakistan, they do that. So, but she is just the kindest, most loving soul. Women are really not encouraged to drive in Pakistan. So she was so excited to learn how to drive. I made sure as I'm, as I'm doing all of these things to expose my children to them and to talk them through all of the issues that I had with the church. So that because I figured I'm going to give them as much information as they as as I have, and then they get to decide wherever they land. So I told them things like, if you want to go to the temple, it brings a lot of people peace. I can take you to get your temple recommend interview. I can take you to the temple. It doesn't bring me peace. I will not be going to the temple. Um, go ahead to the next slide. So actually, weirdly enough, I decided to go back to the AUB building. I sat next to one of my many brothers and his kids. That's my dad on the left. Um, and it was exactly like my childhood. It had never changed. Um, after the stories of the temple ritual came out, I definitely limited um, my children's interaction with my dad. I, um, sorry, I miss Melinda. You asked if Roy Jeffs had left FLDS and yes, he had, he did leave the FLDS. I'm sorry to backtrack. Um, so he's now profit in this picture. He's the leader. He's the end all be all. And, um, I took my, a couple of my daughters with me and sat through a meeting and it was just as painful of, as it was when I was little. They're like, they, they, they sing the hymns slowly 
they do what they did in the olden days with the sacrament and they do 12 glass cups to pass the sacrament. So yes, we are all sharing glass cups and there are lipstick um, marks on the glass cup and there is little floaties at the end. So it's really gross. And I was grossed out back when I belonged. Um, but it was the exact same. It hadn't changed. And then the photo on the right is Brigham Young, Joseph Smith in the middle, and then John Taylor. So those are, and, and if you can read the writing at the bottom, it says a uh, kingdom of God or nothing. And that is definitely how my dad lived. So you have, you live the everlasting covenant. You respect your priesthood, very old school uh, um, LDS or nothing, or you go to hell. So that was definitely the, the vibe I grew up with. All right, next slide. Um, I ended up taking care of my mom. At the end, she had Parkinson's and dementia, and she very much vacillated between polygamy and mainstream LDS, which made it very hard. Um, and so she was very close and had a lot of really good friends in polygamy and would tell them like, I'm going to, I'm going to go back to polygamy. I want to be in that community. And then she would tell the mainstream LDS people or me, cause she thought I was still mainstream LDS. I didn't have the heart to tell her I was out, um, that she didn't ever want to be back in polygamy, that she hated my dad, but she kept, so she definitely couldn't pick between the two. And I really couldn't blame her. So when she passed away, I had the responsibility of the whole funeral and everything else. And I had a lot of the AUB members come to me and say, your dad needs to conduct the meeting. You need a priesthood holder. And then I would have the mainstream LDS kit people come to me and say, the bishop needs to conduct the, the funeral. You need to have the plan of salvation and the bishop needs to conduct and I got really tired of it and so at one point with the um, AUB polygamist um, I said I said no we're going to just have it at the funeral home and she said well who's going to be the priesthood holder and I said I will I will be the priesthood holder and that kept her she stopped asking about it finally um, so but I made sure I was very respectful to my dad let him be not part of the funeral but have a place to sit and um, he was very heartbroken over my mom divorcing him, even though he was not a great guy. Um, so that's just me taking care of my mom and then being in charge of the entire funeral by myself. All right, next photo. Um, this is at my mom's funeral. This is my dad in the middle and then the four remaining wives. So if you remember, my Aunt Colleen on the very right-hand side is not married to my dad anymore, uh, right-hand side with the blonde hair. Yeah, she's not married to my dad anymore. So she was like, I can't believe I'm sitting in this picture. She did not enjoy that picture. Um, but those are the siblings that ended up coming to my mom's funeral, obviously like the other wives. Um, and that is not the AUB building. That is the funeral home because I refused to have the funeral at the AUB. I absolutely refused. Um, and I'm in the very back corner, like hiding in the back because I didn't really care. It was whatever. It didn't matter. Um, okay. So that's just the, up, the update on that one. You can go ahead and flip to the next one. Okay. So then my dad passed away in 2019. Um, and sorry. Uh, yeah, it was actually, sorry, 2021. So he just passed away this past October and being able to meet people where they are, being able to love my siblings, love a community without this like worry and concern about my own testimony. And what do I think? And what is what is my ward going to think? And what is, what is someone else going to think made me, um, really be able to be present and in the moment and just enjoy being with family. And one of the biggest helpers for that was actually the podcast, uh, secular Buddhism by Noah Rochetta. I know he's in a mixed faith marriage. He is out. I think he's Buddhist. And then his wife is active F, or active mainstream LDS. And it really helped me be able to be okay with who I was and then be okay with wherever my siblings are, wherever anyone is. 
I can love them and be respectful of them and meet them where they are. And it really made a huge difference for me to be able to just enjoy being with my siblings at my dad's funeral. This is in the AUB. The blue curtains behind is the stage. If you can see in the very, very right-hand corner, you can see the bottom of the wording saying um, kingdom of God or nothing. Um, so the stage, if you open the curtains, it has the place where the brethren can sit, the 12 apostles, the council. Um, no fights for basketball. Basketball is part of the religion, obviously. Anyone who's mainstream LES, AUB definitely carried that. Um, that's why there's a basketball court right there, obviously. So what they do is they'll just set up folding chairs and then hold meetings. Everything is facing that stage with the blue curtains. Um, and then my dad is on the left behind those, well, in front of the purple curtains, the coffin is covered up. Um, and then they put us in birth order in this photo. We are missing siblings. Um, and the first one on the left, I don't know who she is because, my dad and apparently some of his wives, um, dev, uh, they did the sealing thing. So I think in, in old time Mormonism, 1800s, Brigham Young era, if you got sealed to your parents, then you were sealed to them for time, not your parents, but somebody else, you got sealed to them for time and all eternity. So that definitely carried down through AUB. And um, she got sealed to my, one of my moms and my dad, and I don't know who she is. There was a couple times in my dad's funeral that I would lean over to my sister and be like, I don't know who that is. Who's that? And she'd be like, oh, that's your sister. I'm like, oh, that's fun. So, um, and then I feel like a lot of people can resonate with the, you have like a Native American princess in your line that was told by my dad and it's not true. Just so you know, we did not have any Native blood in our, as you can clearly see, pure like European, sadly, like no color whatsoever. Um, I don't know where he picked up that story, but it was actually told at his funeral. So I'm sitting there listening to my brothers talk and they're talking about how generational great grandfather married a Cherokee princess. It was awful. I was dying. Um, so sorry about that. I think it's pretty, it can be, I've talked to other mainstream LDS people. I think they have a random weird stories about that too. I don't know where that came from. It's weird. Um, anyway, so that, and I'm in the middle, I'm of course standing to the like shortest person. So I don't know. She's my sister, Wendy. I can name a lot of them, but I can't name everyone because I did leave at 16. So I know a lot of them, but I don't know all of them, but um, those are all of the, well, not all of them, most of my siblings and half siblings. All right, next photo. So this is us. This is just this past summer. These are my children. I have three daughters, 20, 18, and 15. We are all out. Um, I became my husband's worst nightmare and I left the church and I took all of my family with me. And I tried very hard not to be a bitter ex-Mormon, but I can find myself bitter at times. And um, my, I, I had a piece of advice that I have shared with my children consistently. And that is, we live in Salt Lake City, Utah, and it is Mormon town. And it would look, diff it would look the same if we lived in the Vatican area. And so you get to navigate what it is like to have LDS friends, and the choices you make, how it's going to affect what they do. So my example, my 11 year old kept saying, oh my God. And I said, that's fine. You can say that it's not upsetting to me, but it is very upsetting to your LDS friends. And if you want to keep them or not ostracize future LDS friends, you have to be aware that the words you say will have an effect on that. So you can choose to do with it what you would like but these are the effects that are going to happen. These are the consequences of your actions. And I kind of do that with my kids dating. Um, I let them know like, Hey, remember LDS rules is 16. Um, this is what it's going to look like. Um, and so I make sure that I talk to my children about the effects of growing up in a Mormon town. Um, my husband did leave the church also. So, so fun. I just was quiet for so long went to church. I got to the point where I told him, 
I can't go to church anymore. It's too hard for me to hear the messages. I can't do it. I'm not going anymore. But if you want to go and you want the kids to go, I will help the kids get to church. I will send you guys off. And we never went back. So he's out too. Um, he's definitely more private about his path and his journey. And I'm okay with that because he's always given me space to work through my emotions, work through the hardship and, um, really has supported me through the whole thing. He is very private and kind of doesn't talk a lot about it. Doesn't feel comfortable talking about it, but he has always given me given, always given me the space to be who I am. So for that, I am so grateful. I can't imagine being married to someone who wanted to keep trying to take me to the temple or keep trying to read scriptures to me and tell me that if only we had um, couple prayer and couple scripture study that I would get my testimony back. And I, I forever am so grateful for that and respect him for that. So that's my story in a nutshell. That's all I got. Wow. And what a nutshell that is. <laughs> Thank you so <laughs> much, Liz. That, that is just incredible. I mean, the only word I, I can think of a lot of words, but the main one is just inspiring everything that you went through and just your positive attitude through all of it and loving everyone throughout it, all of it and sharing that. I just, we are so glad that you came and talked to us tonight. So we'll, we have a couple minutes for some questions. If anybody has a question that they weren't able to put in the chat and they'd like to ask Liz, just raise your, uh, raise your mechanical hand. <laughs> if anybody has anything they'd like to ask, we'll do that for a couple minutes. Oops, Tom. Anybody have a question? I thought I saw one. Liz, do you, uh, uh, having been raised in polygamy, um, are you a staunch anti-polygamist now, or do you say, well, I love my family and I, you know, what, what's your, what's your position on it now? How do you, how do you stand with having people on both sides? Um, I, I definitely am not anti-polygamy. I know it is damaging. And, um, I see the damage, the sister that I'm closest to is active in the AUB and the way that it's handled is not okay. Um, but I do know her heart and I know that she comes from a place of love and her belief. And I know that I was once in that place. So I'm not anti-polygamist. I just, um, it, it just makes me sad. I'd have to say, I definitely am okay holding her in her space. If that's her truth, that's what makes her happy then I will make space for that and love her for that. Um, so no, I guess I'm not anti-polygamist. I don't actively go after polygamists or make them feel bad or tell them they're wrong. Um, because I do know that there a lot of their hearts are good and it really has to do with that's actually what they believe in. So who am I to tell them any different, especially because that's where I came from and I was a good person. I am a good person. I try every day to be good. So I don't have a right to tell them or um, that that they're wrong. So no, I guess I'm not anti-polygamous. I don't believe it. I think it's awful, um, but that's not for me to decide for other people. Yeah, you're just so loving, Liz. I mean, that's what comes through in your entire story is just such a loving person. Bruce, you had a question. Well, first, uh, Tiffany asked in the chat, how did your dad support all his wives and kids? The wives so my dad was a construction worker. We used to laugh that he was like a carpenter, like Jesus. And I was so proud of that because we were so special. Um, but he had his own construction business. Um, and to be put a short answer, he didn't. AUB is very staunch on not depending on the government. So we did not do food stamps. We just were poor. My mom worked as a secretary in the public school system forever and got her retirement from that. Um, every wife worked. I think my aunt Rachel didn't work and she lived very poor. Um, my dad definitely only gave money on conditions that the, his wives were obedient. So there came a point where my mom no longer got any money from him. So they all kind of worked outside of the home. <laughs> That's fascinating. And Bruce, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I just have, I mean, we have some experience in the group where 
uh, kids raised outside of the LDS church get hooked back in through uh, Flirt to Convert. Have you come very close uh, to that with any of your kids? No, um, I definitely haven't. I think right now, because of where I'm at, I have three older daughters and then my boys are younger. They're 10 and 11, 11 and 12. And so I haven't had to deal with it with my boys yet. And my girls don't fit the mold of being a good LDS option. My daughter at 12 decided she didn't want children. So, and we were active. And and so it was like, okay, well, just so you know, that's going to affect maybe who your potential spouse is going to be because- that's a big thing in Mormonism to have lots of babies. Um, so I, not for my daughters, they're definitely very, they know who they are. They know what they want. They know the damage that the patriarchy can create and they're doing their best to follow their inner compass. And really that's all I want for my daughters. And then my sons, I just, I mean, there's always the potential they could. I doubt it. I feel like we have very open, honest, hard conversations at our home and we try to talk through the consequences of our actions. So if one of my children do the flirt to convert and some LDS woman has sucked one of my children back in, I will still love them and make sure that there is space for them and make them feel heard and loved because I know my children are good people. And if that's where they landed, then that's where they landed. That's important to have those conversations. Yeah, I didn't, and I'm on the other side of it. Karen, you had a question. Oh, you know, it's not a question so much as a comment. And Liz, I am just, I am phenomenally touched. I have no Mormon experience other than the book club, but I'm here to just, just learn more about people. And you just blow me away. And as a mother of daughters, uh, my daughters are much older than yours. I just, uh, I just love the story you told, how much you learned from your difficulties and the goodness that you are uh, teaching your children as a result of the hardship. And I, I mostly um, commend you for opening your children's minds to accepting people of different faiths. And, you know, it's not like you have to believe like them, but just respect their belief and uh, expose them to the positives. So I, I love your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Those are really kind words. Um, I think there's a question on the bottom, uh, Cynthia. Uh, would you be willing to share where you are in your belief in Christ and God? Um, yeah, I think... I think I'm okay with not knowing. I think I'm okay with the unknown. I think that a lot of teachings of Jesus Christ, he was a radical person of his time. And he really broke a lot of the molds of what had been, been taught previously. And one of them being that you're diseased because you have sinned. He really broke that mold and really opened up the ability for us to separate sin and disease and showed love unconditionally. And for that, I will glean and appreciate and love that. Um, and if there's a heavenly father or a God or whatever spaghetti person in heaven, um, I'm okay with not knowing. I'm, I'm being comfortable with not the unknown because in Mormonism, you, you get told all the answers. It, it fits so nicely in this box and they have an answer for everything. And it's kind of a scary, unsettling place to let that all go and just be in what is. So I don't know what the future is going to hold when I pass away, but I know right here in this moment, I can be where I am and sit in it, whatever that looks like. So I don't really know. That's a beautiful perspective though. I love that. I love that. Allison, you had a question. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? I just want to make sure I'm doing this. Okay. We can hear you. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. Okay. Um, Liz, I just want to thank you so much. Uh, I have never been Mormon, um, but I live here in Utah. And we have many mutual friends I noticed on Facebook. I have friends that are in the AUB, out of the AUB, uh, friends with Andrew Chatwin, and we have just a lot of 
close friends. This is my question. My question is, is that you and I are around the same age. Do you have any recollection of Bob Foster, which is the Rockland Ranch Group? Uh, they used to be quasi AUB. Do you ever have any recollection of having any family or friends move down there? And do you still have any current um, connection with Rockland Ranch and Bob Foster and them? Um, is that Rockland Ranch in Wyoming? No, it okay. is. Um, it's um, Hatch Rock south of Moab, but they're like a Oh. almost like a commune and Bob Foster I mean a lot of them were baptized in the AUB but they mm -hmm. kind of do their own thing but I, I know that, that sounds completely off but I feel like you kind of know what I'm talking about because yeah. they are part of the AUB they just do their own yeah. thing so when my dad became prophet he actually there was a spit a split a, a chism a, a schism a, right a, um <laughs> the AUB, he actually was the cause of another split. Um, and I yes. think it had to do with his dishonesty with tithing money and, yes. um, and the accusations of, of a different daughter, um, having some molestation accusations. And I have been out since I was 16. So I'm old now. Right. And I, I have my family connections, um, from my, uh, full, siblings but as far as like my half siblings most of all of them as far as I know are active AUB and I don't okay. have a lot of connection with them um I don't have any idea so the short answer no I don't have any connection there I don't know any siblings that live there I do know what you're talking about I I've personally never been there um, oh that's okay so yeah I was out at 16 and really just living my mainstream LDS dream so why you know why do any of that so yeah I didn't I didn't have any experience <laughs> never look back that's the answer right oh, thank you so much <laughs> okay I think we have one more question and then we'll end so we're right on the half hour and this is Steve who is in the middle of a hurricane how are you doing first Steve before you ask your question <laughs> I'm, I'm doing okay I'm waiting for the it's 11 okay. o'clock uh, forecast to come through so hopefully it'll be, able, it'll be fine um first of all I Elizabeth, I, I just want to let you know, I just made you a friend request on, uh, on Facebook. Awesome. Um, I was just going to hop in for a few minutes because like, I got this freaking hurricane coming down. But uh, what a compelling story. Wow. And uh, I, I just I, I found it so fascinating. And I just want to thank you for sharing your story. Um, I stepped away briefly. And you had said that around the age of 16, you decided that you were going to leave the church and I, I missed that. Can you just okay. briefly men mention that? And also uh, one more thing, Rebecca, I don't know about you, but I think you and I should do a special episode where we- uh, I already her. told you that, Steve. I'm your scout, your advanced scout. I find these people. <laughs> I already told you that. So. Yeah, so I, I think I think <laughs> that's sure. gonna happen. So uh, yeah, anyway, that. Elizabeth, uh, accept my friend request. And I, I, I just wanna hear real quick about why you left because I, I did miss that. Um, yeah, so really fast. The leader at the time was my grandpa's brother, Owen Allred. He was the prophet, the leader of the AUB. And I was sitting in church doing what good AUB people do. And I was writing all the notes. And one thing he said was, um, what makes our break off of the church the correct break off? And that was the thought stop that I had where I was like, wait a minute, we're a break off. And there's more breakoffs. And, and so, but why don't, why am I not part of the mainstream LDS church then? Like it was the word break off and that he oh. kept us in with all the other breakoffs, which mainstream LDS is also a break off. So obviously I recognize that now, but at the time I thought oh, that's weird. And, um, it really made me stop and think. And then my sister had bore her testimony of mainstream LDS church and that, I, there was no looking back after that. I knew that's where I wanted to be. And, and now looking back in my life, I can say it was the guaranteed sense of community, the guaranteed, I didn't have to live in secrecy anymore. Automatic friends, automatic community, automatic, more options of who to marry. I mean, there's only so many people in the AUB and a lot of them are my cousins. Yeah. So and we are not into incest. 
So kind of limited down who we could marry. So that's really um, what the pivot point was for me. And just real quick, your your grandfather, it seems like what's so interesting to me is that he, he seems like he was a really decent man. Yeah. And it doesn't sound to me like there's a hint of scandal about the guy that he was a truly sincere, decent human being. Um, it, I, I find that very interesting because I think a lot of like I'm an evangelical Christian um, from the outside. A lot of people are scandalized by polygamy. And you had mentioned how you are not like against polygamy. I, I, I it seems like he was a man of integrity, kind of like Ogden Kraut was a man of integrity. Um, you know, it just goes to show that there are decent people who do practice the principle and we shouldn't just completely write the whole thing off, at least the people. Yeah. Yeah. And I would have to say, I agree with that perception. That's really been my personal experience is that the people that surrounded me and the stories that I heard of my grandpa are truly good at heart people. So I keep that in mind as I try to navigate through their belief system. Thank you. Oh, I love that answer. And again, love. I think this whole story was just so inspiring and about loving throughout. So Liz, thank you. Just amazing. I mean, we were riveted. It was just incredible. Just so amazing. Let's go to our final slide just to say goodbye. And thank you everybody for attending this. I hope this was worth it to all of you. I just enjoyed it so much. And it was so wonderful to get to know Liz and hear her story. Yay. Thank you. Right. Thank Yay. you for having me. What an yep. awesome opportunity. It was wonderful. So if you are uh, not a member of our book club and you'd like to be, we have a slide coming up here where it just kind of gives our contact information. Um, you can connect with us on Facebook, look up The Good Book Club or Instagram, The Good Book Club. Just try to find us. You can also email me at thegoodbookclub at mail.com. Um, just one more quick shout out, our book club book for October, which is going to be on Sunday. Um, so, okay, there's a the contact information. And then our book for October on the 23rd, Sunday at 11 a.m. is going to be Early Mormonism and the Magical World View. And that's going to be an amazing media presentation. So find us, get more information, come read with us. We have a lot of fun and just a, a lot of communities. So thank you, everybody. We will officially say good night until next time. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, everybody.